Amen. God is a good, good father. Amen. Amen. Now, we have tough times in life, and sometimes we want to question that fact, but uh, we shouldn't because God is good. He is always good, and he loves us, and he provides for us no matter what our experience in life might be. It is great to see you this morning. I appreciate you coming and being with us. If you're here in the building or if you're online, we welcome you to worship with us today. And we're continuing in this series on the book of Luke. The subtitle is Making Jesus Known, Making Jesus Known. And that's why Luke wrote the book was so that he could make Jesus known and the other gospel writers as well. And today we're talking about how to feed a multitude, how to feed a multitude. Uh, before I start the message today, I want to say a word of congratulations to Brother Rick and his wife Carol, who are celebrating his 10th staff anniversary with our church today, or this week. Uh, Rick was pastor of the Holt Baptist Church for many years, and now he's co-pastor with me at Forest Lake, and we just appreciate their ministry. And if you get a chance, uh, tell them that uh, before you leave today. All right? So how to feed a multitude, how to feed a multitude. Uh, years ago, Back in the early 70s, and I know when I say that, some of you think that was when time began, but it wasn't quite that long ago. Uh, my parents uh, decided they would open a restaurant, and so they opened a little cafe in the town of Sherman, Mississippi, and uh, they called it Payne's Fish and Steakhouse. Big name for a little bitty business. It started really, really small, and uh, before they finished, they sold it about 20 years later. It had been in three lo different locations in that area, because it grew so much, and uh, they, I was a late teen at the time, and of course it was a family business, and I had to work, and I knew nothing about uh, restaurants, and I knew nothing about cooking, and so I started washing dishes. That was my first job, was to wash dishes and clean tables. Now, that'll humble you in real fast, you know, when you put an apron on. I had to wear an apron. My goodness, that uh, did something to my self-esteem as a teenage boy, about 16, 17 years old. Uh, but I started doing that, and then uh, over a period of time, I graduated, and Daddy put me on the steak pit. They had a large charcoal grill, and I was cooking steaks. And that was back when we had a loin of uh, beef that we would roll it out on a cart to the table where the uh, patrons were sitting. I had a big old butcher knife, and I would cut it just as thick as they wanted the steak cut, and then I'd go back and I'd cook it for them. Business just exploded. And I remember one, one night when I was standing there uh, cooking uh, that we had hundreds of people that would come through the restaurant in a period of four, five, six hours. And I can remember having 50 or 60 steaks at one time on that grill, cooking them to different degrees of doneness uh, based on the preference of the people that had ordered them uh, and, and developed some ability in that area. And they even gave me the nickname of Steak Man. That was my name, cooking those steaks, you know. And I was uh, having a great time. And we were feeding the multitudes, literally feeding the multitudes. Well, the story that we talk about today coming out of Luke chapter 9 is about Jesus literally feeding the multitudes. It starts in Luke chapter 9 in verse 10. Here's, here's the passage. When the apostles returned from the mission that Jesus sent them out on, they gave an account to him of all they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him. And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat. For here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. Verse 14, for there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. So they did so, and they had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. 
and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, twelve baskets full. Would you pray with me? Let's pray for just a moment. Father, thank you for letting us come and worship you today. Thank you for the precious, holy, and perfect word of God that you have preserved for us. And now we live in a country where we have the freedom to gather in a place like this today and open scripture and hear a word directly from you. We pray, Father, that you'll speak to us through this passage and that you'll help us to understand the great need of the masses in the world around us and how you want to feed them and how we can be a part of that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. How to feed the multitudes. Now, this story is called the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the multitudes. And it's very uh, well known among Christian circles, uh, so much so because it's recorded in all four Gospels. All four of the Gospel writers record this story and have different nuances about what happened on that particular day. It is a famous passage. So you've probably heard sermons many times on this story before. You probably read about it as a child in a Sunday school class or a vacation Bible school before. The feeding of the 5,000, how Jesus took a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread and he fed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. So my question is, what's the point of the story? What is the point of the story? Is the point of the story the power of God? that Jesus, God, has the power to do anything. Well, I would certainly say that that can be and is a part of the story, but it's not the major point of the story in its purpose. Because the disciples, according to the book of Luke, had already witnessed Jesus doing many powerful things up until we get to the point of chapter 9. The Bible says that they had heard him and seen him teach with great authority, so much so that the people were in awe, and they said, no one has ever taught like this before. They had seen Jesus uh, walk through a crowd where they were going to physically harm him. Miraculously, he was able to pass through them without being harmed at all. The Bible says, according to Luke, that he had healed the sick and the diseased, that he had walked on, uh, that he had calmed the storm at sea. The Bible says that he had uh, cured the lepers. The scripture records, according to Luke, that he had straightened the twisted limbs of the crippled. The scripture says that he had even raised the dead before this happened. So I don't think Luke is trying to make the point that God is all-powerful and that he can do anything, even though God is all-powerful and he can do anything. Can I get an amen? He certainly is. I read about a small village in a remote remote place of the earth that had an earthquake that struck that particular place. And it seemed like everybody there was so disturbed, and rightly so, by the earthquake. I think they had one down on the edge of the Florida line a few days ago. Everyone in that village was disturbed except one old woman, and she just seemed so calm and so much at peace during that earthquake. And so they finally asked her, what is your secret to having peace when everyone else is so disturbed? This is how she responded. She said, I'm just so glad that I have a God that's strong enough to shake the earth. Are you glad that you have a God that's strong enough to shake the earth? Our God can do anything. Nothing is impossible for God. So I don't know what your circumstance is or what your situation, but God can step into that and make a difference just like that. Just like that. Your whole perspective, your whole world can change. Is it obvious that I want to preach on the subject of the power of God today? But I can't because that's not the main thrust of the passage I do not believe. I think the main thrust of the passage is that God wants the whole world to know about his son, Jesus Christ. And if you'll study the context of this passage, I think you'll get that with me as well today. So let's look at it. There are three main characters that we're going to see here this morning. We're going to see the Christians or the disciples. We're going to see the crowd, and we're going to see Christ. So if you're looking for a three-point outline, that's it. First of all, we're going to look at the Christians, those believers who needed a rest. These disciples who were following after Jesus needed a rest. A rest. Look at verse 10. The apostles returned. They gave an account to him of all that they had done, taking them with him. He withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. Now, Patrick preached on the fact that Jesus sent out the 12 apostles. 
He sent them out in teams of two on a preaching and healing mission. And the Bible says that they came back and began to report to him all the wonderful things that had happened in their ministries. And they were exhilarated by the success of what God had done through them. But they were also exhausted by the ministry activities. They were tired because they had been so busy. You know, we live in a society that's tired. We, we are tired because we are so busy all the time. One writer put it this way, Henry Gruber, he said, don't take time off from work. Work keeps your mind busy. Well, I, I like that because we, we believe in a strong work ethic. This is the weekend that we celebrate Labor Day. But at the same time, you can't work all the time. You have to have time where you back away from work and you rest and you regather your energies. One survey found that four out of 10 Americans admitted to cutting back on sleep to gain time for their daily activities. Now, don't raise your hand if you're guilty of that, okay? Don't, don't raise your hand if you've, you've uh, cut yourself out of some sleep because you had so many things you had to get done the next day. We need regular seasons of rest. The disciples needed that. Jesus knew that even if they didn't know it. And so Jesus left where he was and went to another place called Bethsaida. And one of the reasons he did that was so that they might get some rest. Now, the larger context of this uh, story is this. Jesus is finishing his Galilean ministry. Jesus is beginning to withdraw from the crowds. And he's beginning now from this point on in the, in the book of Luke to focus on these disciples and give them some intensive time of training because he knows he's going to the cross. Jesus is headed toward Jerusalem and he knows he's going to die there for the sins of all mankind and he knows that he's going to be raised from the dead and then 40 days later he's going to ascend back to the Father. He's going back to heaven and the ministry that he has started is going to be handed off to the disciples and especially these 12 guys and so he's pouring his life into them from this point on and so what does he do? They come back and give him this report about how, how wonderful things have gone on their preaching and healing junket. And he says, okay, guys, let's, let's go away. And so the Bible says they get in the boat and they sail over toward the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee to a place called Bethsaida. And there he is with them privately in this deserted or desolate place so that they could be alone. Now, if you look at the map, you'll notice that the Sea of Galilee, we're, we're basically facing north today. The Sea of Galilee would be over in this section, and they go to the, to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, just on the other side of the, where the Jordan River comes down from Mount Hermon and dumps into the sea, about a mile the other side of that. There they go to this place where Peter and Andrew and Philip were from. It was their hometown. There's where they were from, and so it was familiar to them. Jesus goes to this small place so they can get alone from the crowd. Why? Because they were tired. They'd been so busy, they were worn out. They were on the edge of burnout, I believe. They were so fatigued that it colored their perspectives on the values of life. And when the crowd follows them there, they don't see them as people who need Jesus or people who need ministry. They see them as a nuisance to them. Now you have to stop and think who these people were. Many of them were friends. Many of them were neighbors that Peter and Philip and Andrew had grown up with. Some of them might have been family members. These were people that had traveled a long way to get to where Jesus was, and yet they saw them as a nuisance. The 12 decide that they're going to form a delegation, and Jesus had been busy all day long teaching and healing and helping people. So the 12 formed their own little delegation. They go to Jesus and they purport to tell him how to do his ministry. Now, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box, but I know one thing you don't need to do is tell Jesus how to do his ministry, okay? They come to Jesus, and it's almost as though they blurt out, send them away, send them away. We're so tired of all of this stuff, Jesus, all this ministry. It's like the pastor I heard about one time that said, you know, ministry would be so much fun if it just wasn't for all these people. All these people, I'm just so tired of all these people. Now, you may not be able to identify with that, but you may identify with this. There was a woman that said, you know, the greatest gift that my husband ever gave me for Mother's Day 
was a brand new garden hose, 50 feet long, beautiful green garden hose. And she said, the reason it was so beautiful, she said, because 10 years before that, I had used an old black uh, hose to water my um, grass and my flowers with. And over a period of time, it developed a crack right in the middle of it and water was spewing up. And so she said, rather than get another hose, I just, you know, use what I have. And so she said, I was able to rearrange the hose so it would spurt in two directions at the same time. And that worked pretty good for a while until two other cracks developed in it. And then it had four spigots of water coming out of it. And she said, I was able to position the hose in such a way again so that it was watering four different areas at the same time. Looked like a beautiful fountain out there in my yard while it was watering things. And that worked okay until one day when the end blew off of it and water just went all over me and drenched me from head to foot. She said, my husband said, that's enough. I'm going to get you a new water hose. And he did. Best Mother's Day present I ever had. Now I want you to think about your life for just a moment. Is your life like that water hose? Really? Is it like that water hose? You've got a leak over here and a leak over there and a leak over here. And, and you, ha you don't really realize how dumb that is. It's just developed over a period of time. You've added one thing and another thing, and your life is scattered going in so many direct, different directions. You don't have time for that which is most important. And I can tell you which is most important. That is to spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. And yet, we use our busyness and our hectic schedule even as an excuse for not spending time with Jesus, which is the most important thing. So Jesus said to his guys, guys, it really doesn't matter how many sermons you've preached or how many people you've healed. If you haven't been with me, you haven't done the right thing. Let's go. Let's go. And so he pulled them aside so they could have some time with him. They are the Christians who just needed to rest. And secondly, I see the crowds who just need someone to rescue them. They need someone to rescue them. They're desperately in need of help. That's what verse 11 says. The crowds wanted Jesus so much that they followed him. They followed him. And here's the beautiful picture there, that when he came to them, or when they came to Jesus, that he, that they, that he is welcoming them. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. He is welcoming them. He starts to speak to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. The crowds just would not let Jesus escape. They wanted him so much. And so they saw him get into a boat and they saw him sail to the other side of the sea, the Bethsaida. And they began to follow him. Well, some of them probably got in their own boats and followed after him that way. But most of them walked along the shore. They walked along the northern shore from the city of Capernaum over to Bethsaida, which meant, remember what I told you about the, the headwaters of the Mount Hermon flowing down into the Sea of Galilee, which meant they had to cross the Jordan River to get over to Bethsaida where Jesus was on that particular day. But they followed after him, some by foot, some by boat, from every town and every village, a vast multitude of people. Luke says that there were over 5,000 men which were fed that day, which meant this, because most Jewish men were married. If there were 5,000 men, there were probably about 5,000 women. All the ladies say amen. About 5,000 women were there as well. And they took literally the admonition out of Genesis to be fruitful and multiply, which means there were some kids there as well. They probably had... One, two, three, four children. We don't know. There's a good estimate that Jesus actually fed maybe 15 or 20,000 people on that day. And think about all the throngs of people that are crowded around Christ that day, trying to get close to him, trying to hear him teach something that they needed to hear, trying to touch him or get him to touch them so that they could be healed. Before you know it, the day's gone. They've lost all sense of taking care of their personal needs so that there is no food for them to eat. There is no place for them to spend the night. They just wanted and needed Jesus. I heard about a little boy that stepped into a uh, swollen river, and before he knew it, the current started taking him away, but it was fortunate that there was someone close by that could uh, latch on to him and pull him back in. It took several people to keep him from drowning on that particular day. And someone asked him when they finally got him to shore, did he fall in? Did he fall in? And he said, no, I didn't fall in. I just wanted to see how strong the current was. 
I know a lot of people that have kind of flirted with different areas of life just wanting to see how strong the current is and not realizing it, not wanting it, but the currents of life have swept them away. And they need someone to rescue them. Someone to extend an arm of love and latch onto them. And Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8, God says to the people, I have come to rescue them from the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own good land. I have some good news for you today. God is in the rescue business. The rescue business. So whatever it is that you might feel like you're drowning from, whatever it is that's got a hold of you that's larger than life or larger than you, it's not larger than God. And he can reach down and he can rescue you. He can deliver you from that. He can. That's why Jesus came to the earth anyway. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 says of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Christ came and died on the cross and gave his blood so that he might rescue us. You say, oh, well, I I really don't need rescuing. Well, you just don't know it. You need to be rescued from your own sins. You need to be delivered from a, a lifestyle that is headed for an eternal hell. That's why Christ came, because he loves you so much. He came to rescue you. That's what Jesus said about his own ministry in Luke chapter 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, knowing what we know about Jesus, as this crowd presses around him, we we know how he's going to respond, don't we? We know what he's going to do. The Bible says he began to welcome them. And that's a wonderful word in the Greek. It has the connotation of, of warm and continuous It's as though when when these bruised and battered people begin stretching their arms out for Christ, that he responds to them by saying, well, where have you been? I've been looking for you a long time. And he welcomes them. Is that our response to those around us who are hurting and need Christ? Where have you been? I've been looking for you for such a long time. Or do we treat them as a nuisance? You know, there's a strange custom in America that's fading away, but for so many years at the front door of every house would be a mat that you could wipe your feet on. And oftentimes that mat would say, welcome. Have you ever had a welcome mat? Would you just admit that? You've had a, I literally said welcome at the front door. And yet when somebody showed up unannounced, the last thing you wanted to do was welcome them. I mean, you were busy. You were doing stuff. You, you, didn't, you didn't want them to come and disturb you. And so someone sarcastically suggested that we might change the word welcome on the mat to something like out of town and definitely try again next year. Or here's one. Oh, no, not you again. Yeah, I, I felt that one. Or here's one that's more appropriate for our age. That is quarantine. Quarantine. No, Jesus welcomed them. Here's the good news. When you come to Jesus Christ and you're bruised and you're battered and you're broken, that's the way Jesus welcomes you. He says, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you came. As a matter of fact, I've been looking for you. I've been searching for you. Years ago when we moved to New Orleans and I went to seminary, I thought I was going to get a church pastoring down there, and I didn't. Because, uh, not because I was a dud, but because there were just too many preachers for all the positions that were available. And so I got a job working at the Baptist Hospital as a security guard. And I was standing at the door, and it was a humbling experience, but a very, a very good one. And what I realized uh, as I stood at the door, my job was to open the door for everybody that came into the hospital and everybody that left the hospital. Okay, That's, that'll give you a good dose of humility. And my job was to say, welcome to the Baptist Hospital. And I did it first because I was getting paid to do it. I'll just admit that. I was getting a paycheck. My family was hungry. Charlotte was back home. We had a little girl two years old. I had to feed them. I did it because I was getting paid. But it wasn't long before God spoke to my heart. And he said, listen, folks that come in and out of these doors at the Baptist Hospital have tremendous burdens. And God is giving you an opportunity to minister to them. And I tried to use that opportunity that way to welcome them 
into a place that would care for them and help them. There are the Christians who need a rest. There are the crowds who need somebody to rescue them. And then there's Christ in this story who needs someone to represent him. There's Christ. Now, Jesus was in a physical body, and he was limited by what he could do in that physical body. Yes, he's God, but he still could only be in one place at one time. And if these multitudes are going to be fed, then somebody is going to have to help Jesus. You understand? You, you see where I'm going with this? Somebody's going to have to help Jesus with this. The sun is going down. The golden rays of sun, the sunbeams are striking against the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples realize that the day is fast ending and that time is up. And so they say to Jesus, send these people away so they can go somewhere else and find a place to spend the night and get something to eat. But Jesus says to them in verse 13, you give them something to eat. He just couldn't send them away. Jesus could just not send these people away. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't send us away when we come to him with our needs? And so he says to these disciples, these guys that he's handpicked, you give them something to eat. He knew the disciples needed to get involved in the process before the needs were going to get met. So he says, you give them something to eat. Jesus could have fed them. He could have fed them one at a time. But with 10, 20,000 people, he wouldn't have had time to do all of that. The disciples needed to get engaged. And so he said, you give them something to eat. Booker T. Washington said once, a few things will help an individual more than to place responsibility upon him and let him know that you trust him. So Jesus placed this responsibility upon his disciples, and in placing that responsibility upon them, he's letting them know that he trusts them. You know, that's one way to view the responsibility that God has called you to. Not that he's wanting to torture you in some way, but he trusts you with that responsibility. He believes in you. He knows that you can accomplish that through his grace and through his power. The disciples, rather than seeing this as an opportunity, saw it as an obstacle. Their response was, well, Lord, we can't feed all these people. All we've got is five little loaves of bread and two little fish. Lord, you don't understand. We can't do this. We don't have the resources. We don't have the time. We don't have the ability. We, you know, our personality is not right for what you're calling us to do. We don't have the money. We don't have the money. And one even commented in one of the gospel renditions of this, if we had 200 Denarii, 200 days worth of labor, the money sitting in front of us, it's like a guy almost says, if I work for a whole year, we still wouldn't have enough money to buy food to feed all these people. That's his response to Jesus. But what they found was when they obeyed Jesus, God provided everything that they needed. And where did it come from? The, another gospel writer tells us it comes from a little boy who had a sack lunch of sardines and crackers, basically is what they demanded to. He took what one little boy had and he multiplied that and he provided everything that they needed. Now, here's the point for us. God calls us to share his gospel with this world. The question are, are we going to? Or are we going to be like those disciples who first said, we can't do this. We don't have enough money, ability, time, resources, personality, skills. We, we just can't do it, Jesus. Jesus calls us to trust him and he'll provide. Pastor John Aker said that he had boarded a plane uh, at the Newark airport. And he said the computer had assigned him a seat next to a guy named Richard. He'd never met him before. But he struck up a conversation with him, and he learned that Richard had discovered recently that he had skin cancer, and the doctors had given him 10 months to live. And so he was flying to Newark, to who, uh, Nebraska. He's flying to Nebraska to spend the rest of his life. I mean, think about that. You get a diagnosis of cancer. You got less than a year to live, and so he's going to go back home and spend out his days there. And so uh, the pastor's he said, well, man, he said, I just, he said, I'm, I'm so sorry that happened. He said, let me, uh, he said, would you mind if I share with you something that changed my life? And he, Richard said, sure. And so he started sharing the gospel with him. He started sharing about how Jesus had met him in his past 
Jesus had forgiven him, saved him, and he shared the gospel with this guy named Richard. And he said, they're about 10,000 feet over Chicago. Richard put his hand in, in mine, and he said, he said, I need to give my life to Jesus. And he said he prayed and gave his life to Jesus right there on that plane. He said the plane landed. I, I didn't have, really have a way to follow up with him after that. Didn't know if I'd ever see him again. Just didn't know. Uh, the pastor said a few months later, I boarded a plane again at Newark. He said, I sat down in my seat, and he said there was a, a lady that sat beside me. And he said, I struck up a conversation with her. And he said, lo and behold, I learned it was Richard's mother. It was Richard's mother. And he doesn't, he doesn't tell us the rest of the story, but he just simply says this. She turned and, and looked at him, and she said, you know, this wasn't my seat. I was asked to move just a few moments before you got on the plane. And he said, I realize that God is working in people's lives in ways that we don't understand. I think that's the point of that illustration, folks. God is working in people's lives in ways we don't understand. And as you leave the service in a few moments and you go to lunch or, or you go to visit family or, or back to work or where, wherever it is you're going this week, just know that God's going to bring people across your path that he's already working in their lives. And if you'll just make yourself available to be one of those disciples that's willing to give out some bread and some fish, he'll feed them if you just be his hands and his feet in the world this week. So he said in verse 14, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50. So they, they divided the need among the disciples. It's not one person's job to feed everybody. God has certain people that he wants to use you to reach and minister to. And that's what he did. And so Jesus fed the multitudes. Verse 17 says, They all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over picked up 12 baskets full. Now, you know, God never puts anything in the Scripture that's not needed to be there. Would you agree? Everything is in the Bible that needs to be there. So here's the question. Why does it tell us that there were 12 baskets full of food left over after he fed the people? Now, if they'd eaten in the south with us, they probably wouldn't have had anything left over because we eat and then we stuff ourselves until it's all gone, right? But the Bible says that they ate and were satisfied and there were 12 baskets of food that were left over. There was a basket of food left for every apostle that he sent out on a mission just a few verses before. And he sent them out with, he said, don't take an extra bag with you. Don't take anything like that. Just trust the Lord. He's going to take care of you where you go. And he did that on that mission. And now he's reminding them he'll continue to do that through a whole basket full of bread and fish that's left over after they have obeyed him. How to feed a multitude. So what's your takeaway from this? What, 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 how are you going to do that? How, how do we feed a multitude, Brother Donnie? How can we make a dent in the billions of people in our world who have never even heard the name of Jesus. Much less the people around Tuscaloosa that don't understand what the gospel or church or the Bible are about. Well, let me encourage you to do these things. Number one, make time for Jesus. Make time for Jesus in your life. You're never going to be used by Christ for anything in this kingdom if you're not walking with him day by day. So not some time out in your life every day where you spend time with Jesus. Okay? Got that? I don't want to go on until we've all got that. Okay? Spend time with Jesus. Make time for Jesus. Get away. Find a place as he talks about it in the gospels to his disciples. He says, go into your closet and pray there now you don't have to literally go into a closet find a place where you can get away and you can just focus on Jesus you and Jesus start with five minutes a day and build from there but spend some time with Jesus number two as you walk through the world notice the needs that are around you don't be in such a hurry or such a rush that you don't have time to even see what God is doing around you so take time to notice Sometimes it's just a little thing that a person will say in a passing comment that they're hurting, that they need God to do something in their lives. So number one, make time for Jesus. Number two, notice the needs around you. Number three, join Christ in meeting the needs. 
Now, if Jesus makes you aware of a need in somebody else's life, wonder why he does that. (laughs) Is it so you can pray? God bless you. Go and be fed. No, no, it's so that you can help them. God lets you know about those needs so that he can work through you. He's working in their lives already. So step into that mess, whatever it might be, and let God use you, make a difference in their lives. So, number one, make time for Jesus. Number two, notice the needs around you. Number three, join Christ in meeting the needs. And in doing so, number four, share the love of Christ. Share the love of Christ. You're sharing the love of Christ by helping them in some practical way, but you also need to share your story. You need to share how Jesus is helping you. Is Jesus helping you with anything? I said, is Jesus helping you with anything? Uh, Let's try that again. Is Jesus helping you with anything? Then you have a story to tell. You have a story to tell. And your story is not like mine. It will never be like mine. And your story will never be like anybody else's. It's how God is working in and through your life. And if you're willing just to say, hey, man, can I tell you how God helped me make it through surgery a few months ago? Can can I tell you how God blessed me through my grandchildren? And, you know, just sometimes it's a small thing. Tell them how God is stepping into your life and God is working. And it may be just the open door that is needed for them to listen to the story of Jesus. Let's bow together and pray. Father, thank you for letting us worship you this morning. We're so grateful for you sending your son, the Lord Jesus, into this world to be our Savior. We're so grateful that he went to the cross and he died and paid for our sins. We are so grateful that somebody loved us enough to share Jesus with us. And Lord, we come from so many different family circumstances and backgrounds, and there's so many different things that are going on in our lives today. I I would not purport to understand or know all of that. But God, you know. You know where we are, and you know what our circumstances are, and you know whether or not we know you as our personal Savior. You know what we're struggling with. You know what we're searching for. I just pray, Father, that that all of those who are listening to me even now, whether in the room or online, would open their hearts to Jesus, trust Him as their Savior, and those of us who have already done that, to say, Father, I, I don't feel capable, but I want to be one of those that passes out the bread and the fish to feed the multitudes in Jesus' name. Lord, take this worship service. May you receive the honor and glory from it. We pray in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.